Um, you're all very, very welcome to come to this uh, uh, Book at Lunchtime event. Um, my name is Elika, Elika Burma, and I'm Director of, of Torch uh, for, for this academic year. And as most of you will know by now, Torch is the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, and we're here to support, encourage, and facilitate uh, interdisciplinary research with humanities. And we're always very, very keen to hear from people interested in interdisciplinary work, uh, research work um, in this very, very broad field uh, to find out ways in which we can facilitate your work. Um, we have some really great books lined up this term, and I would say that because my book is next on the, on the program. <laughs> they, they, are, they have been wonderful books, and one of them is is Amy Lee's um, stunning comparative encounters between Arturo Michaud and the Zhuangzi, if I pronounce that correctly. I'm sorry, I probably mangled that, with this wonderful, wonderful um, image on, on the cover. And to talk about this book today, to discuss it, we have a panel of three, um, and I'm going to introduce them all together in the order in which they will uh, speak, and then Amy Lee herself will have a chance to, to respond at the end. So first up will be uh, Professor Matthew Reynolds, who's Times Lecturer in English here at Oxford, at St Anne's, across the road. And he will be followed by um, Wong, who is a DPhil student in Oriental Studies, again here at Oxford, um, and Wong is going to be um, speaking to and reading a review of this book of Amy's by Professor Geoffrey Lloyd, who had hoped to join us today, but is in Cambridge and has been detained. Geoffrey uh, Lloyd is Professor of Ancient Comparative Philosophy and Science at Cambridge. And then... Following Wong, um, we will be uh, delighted to hear also from Professor Dame Marina Warner, uh, who is Professor of English and Creative Writing at Birkbeck College, University of London. Um, Amy will then respond, and we will have some time, I think, for some audience questions and discussion. Um, so, thanks very much, and I hand over to Ma Matthew now. Yeah, so I work in, um, in English and comparative literature. Um, so, and this is a book about Michel Arthur, um and the Zwanzi. Um, I, can, I do have some familiarity with the works of Arthur and, and Michel, um, but no familiarity, no familiarity at, at all with the Zwanzi. So um, I'm kind of representing the, you know, the general reader in this discussion and probably the range of possible degrees of expertise that one can imagine a general reader might have. I'm, I'm probably quite low down. <laughs> Uh, low down that scale. So I'm going to um, make some quite general and, uh, and brief introductory remarks, um, and then I think that the, uh, the presentations that follow will be, will, will be kind of more detailed. Um, <clears throat> what, um, so um, looking at the, just at the title of the book, we've got Arthur and Michel there, so these are French, as, 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 as most people in the room must know, so these are, these are, these are French 20th century writers. Um, and if the book just sort of stopped there, if it was a book about Arthur and Michel, you could have a sense of, you know, the kind of thing that it was likely to be doing. Um, these are writers whose lives kind of overlap, um, who are both kind of labelled as, um, who, who, who are both labelled as kind of irrationalist or anti-rationalist, um, who both experiment with drugs um, and write out of that experience. Um, Arthur is diagnosed as insane. So there are lots of points of connection that one can imagine being explored between these two writers. And then you put the, the, the Zwanzi in, uh, in, the, in, in the mix. Um, and the project immediately becomes um, very uh, strange and kind of challenging and uh, problematic in a good way, you know, in the sense of exploring problems. Um, the Zwanzi is a classical Chinese philosophical text that I know nothing about apart from what I've gleaned from reading Amy's book. Um, so it's a philosophical and fictional text kind of mixed together. Um, it's got many different narratives within it, allegorical narratives, kind of fable narratives. Um, it's not a kind of consistent and coherent work, um, so the bits of it, different bits of it are pulling in, in, in different directions. Um, the textual state of it is complicated as well. Um, so, so that's the kind of work that is. Um, and obviously it's kind of a very long way away, um, at first sight at least, from, um, from Arto and Michel. So... What, grabs, what, what interests me in the book is the kind of um, methodological daring 
um, that it represents. Which is to say, if you were just writing about Arthur Michaud, if you're writing about you know, writers in a national tradition or in a shared kind of cultural context, or if you're writing in a kind of established disciplinary framework, you know, for instance, the, the framework of post-colonial studies, there are sort of kinds of argument you're going to be engaging with and things you're going to be doing that are laid down. But when you bring these writers together, it's not at all obvious what you can do with them. Um, it's, it's not at, um, and, and, and what the kind of what the, what the point of the comparison is going to be, what the justification for bringing these writers is going to be. So a really exciting thing that Amy does right at the beginning is plunge into these questions. One of the things I really like um, about the book and the way she writes is the kind of bearing with which she kind of does something, sets about doing something that looks um, at first sight, well, is actually, I think, extremely difficult, but also is obviously um, extremely difficult. The book begins, um, Imagine Arthur and Michel, both Francophone writers of the 20th century, and great admirers of Chinese culture, meeting with the ancient Chinese thinker Zhuangzi for a chat. <laughs> um, and that's quite a difficult thing to do. Um, and among the immediate difficulties, I think, is the feeling that when you've got these very diverse texts, and through your writing, you're going to talk about them and bring them together, um, that you have a lot of power as an interpreter and as a translator, which is to say that what you're going to be doing with the Zwanzi is giving a representation of it in your critical writing in English. You're going to be translating the quotations. And similarly, what you're doing with Arthur and Michaud is similarly you're kind of representing and, and translating them. And one of the anxieties one might have about this project is that the interpreter has too much liberty, can do too much, can work to, can go to work to, as it were, strongly on these texts in order to bring them together. And one of the things that's very exciting about the introduction is Amy says, yes, that is a danger. You know, that is a possibility. <coughs> Um, what I'm giving you is not, you know, we can't ever access the real Zwanzi, we can't ever access the real works of Arthur Michel. What I'm giving you is a representation of these texts that I'm going to conjure up into being, conjure into being and think with. And that's imperfect and problematic in all sorts of ways, but nevertheless it's worth doing. Which is to say, I'm not going to give you the Zwanzi, I'm going to give you my representation of it. And I'm going to think with that and bring that into connection with my representation of Arthur and my representation of Michel. There are all sorts of problems with that, but it's nevertheless worth doing. Um, why is it worth doing? And this is a second kind of really daring uh, thing that Amy takes for granted, I think, and just sort of runs with, which is the idea that the value of the book, what the book is going to discover, is going to emerge in the process of thinking across these two texts. Which is to say, it doesn't kind of define its, its, its framework in advance. It doesn't say, right, I'm going to look at these two texts and compare them in relation to you know, this predetermined thing that I've established in advance. It says, I'm going to, I'm going to think across... These, these texts and see what emerges. And what I'm going to be offering to you as reader is something that I'm going to be discovering in the course of my research and writing the book. Um, and in fact, this is, um, this harks back to me to one of the founding uh, texts of comparative literature by Auerbach, Semonis of Auerbach, um, in which he says, um, when you're setting out on research, you shouldn't have a predetermined idea of the thing you're, you're, you're going to discover. You should look for an ansatz uh, as a starting point, just something that grabs you from one text, and see where that appears elsewhere. You find something that turns out to be worth exploring through the process of exploring it. You can't tell in advance whether it's going to be worth exploring or not. That's something that emerges through the process of thinking. Um, and one of the striking things I think about Amy's book is it's kind of updating um, of that idea. It's taking that idea and, and kind of um, running with it um, in relation to this kind of new uh, grouping, of, grouping of material and, and these new texts. Um, so just to kind of read out a bit that sort of sums this up that Amy wrote, <coughs> the book itself will be a translatedly and comparative medium between the personae that embody Arthur Michel and Zwanzi's works and thought. Um, so the, the book itself as medium, that's another kind of in, in, important thing um, that, I, that, that I want to kind of uh, pre present to the room um, that, that, that perhaps we can discuss um, in due course. Another thing I like about the book um, is its scepticism about constructions of cultural identity. So you could look at this grouping of texts and say, oh my God, there's that Chinese text over there, and there are these French texts over there. These are from quite different cultures. How can we bridge that gap? And one of the things Amy does, um, again at the beginning, is to stay, is to kind of probe this idea that the Zhuangzi is a, is, a, is a Chinese text. It's an ancient Chinese text that needs to be translated by contemporary Chinese people in order to be understood. It's a specific text in a specific context that's quite different from other texts of its time and other later texts. So one thing she immediately does is say, oh, I don't really like this category Chinese. You know, it's a text from a particular moment. And the moment is more specific. When you call it Chinese, you kind of 
uh, solidify it and label it in ways that are not helpful. And the same is true, um, Amy argues, for Arthur and Michaud, um, so that uh, Michaud is Belgian, um, Arthur is of Greek heritage and speaks uh, many languages other than French. So they're both problematically related to the idea of Frenchness. Now, you might think that what follows from this move is a, is a, is, would be an argument that says, OK, we need a much more precise and thorough, um, detailed description of the context, the local context that this writing belongs in. Um, but one of the things that's sort of exhilarating about the book is Omi makes completely the opposite move, which is to say that having, uh, having released the texts from the disciplinary structure of you know, Chineseness or Frenchness, she says, um, I, can, I, I can float them up, really, into the region of ideas, um, and I'm going to think across these texts um, for, in, a, in, a, in a philosophical way um, and pursuing ideas that seem to me to kind of spark between them um, without really um, uh, blocking in local historical context, interpretive context, um, and without actually worrying about questions of influence. So after and Michel both had some awareness of of Chinese, you know, reading some Chinese texts in translation. I think you're not, there's a funny bit where you say, you know, and he may even have read the Zhuangzi. And for many academics, you think, well, that's really a crucial question. I really want to be sure, <laughs> about, you know, whether he's read some bits of this text that I'm talking about. But um, a, a kind of exhilarating, a daring and exhilarating uh, bit of Amy's methodology, she doesn't really mind about that. Um, she says, okay, there's a, you, you, you can think, I'm, I'm going I'm to um, put those, bracket those questions. Um, and, and just think across um, the level of ideas. I, I don't have sight of a clock, so I don't know how long I've been. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what happens, each chapter that follows takes a category that we might use to pigeonhole Arthur and Michaud and rethinks it by the Zhuangzi so as to enable this, us to understand it in a different way. So, for instance, with this idea of rationality, a typical interpretive move would be to say, OK, both these writers are anti-rational writers. What Amy does is goes to the Zhuangzi to rethink the concept of rationality and develop an extended idea of what counts as rationality that can include the, uh, the kind of crazy works of Arthur and Michel within it. A key thing here is the perception that the texts they've written are, after all, written texts, so they're not kind of splurges of, um, kind, of kind of irrationalness, but they're representations of irrationalness that are therefore in the embrace of rationality and make irrationalness available to be thought about. Um, there's a similar move with relation to ethics. So you might say if you've got a conception of ethics as fundamentally involving the relationship between one people and others, you, look, you could look at the text of Arthur and Michel and say, well, these are fundamentally non-ethical or anti-ethical texts. But if you develop a different idea of, of ethics via the Zwanzi, one which... Um, sees it as not necessarily being about the relationship between oneself and others, and more about the relationship between oneself and the cosmos, then again that position um, can, can shift. And texts by Michel and Arthur, which um, would previously have been excluded from a consideration of ethics, can be brought into that, uh, that realm of thought. Now, I was going to read out a, a really fun bit, but I think I'm going to skip that for, uh, for, reasons, uh, for reasons of time. Um, Amy is summing up of the, um, of the kind of um, the, the sort of disciplinary kind of angle that I've been describing um, is the reader would do well to challenge her own preconceptions about reason and knowledge when reading these texts, when reading the Zwanzi and Arthur Michel. For the ideas and literary expression of these texts demand an expanded understanding of reason and knowledge on the critic's part. Um, and this expanded understanding comes crucially by reading the Zhuangzi, this Chinese, this not exactly Chinese, but nevertheless Chinese text and these French texts together. Non-Occidental perspectives are not a refuge for failed or unsettled intellectual attempts of the West, but rather necessary elements for a broader and better informed view of many common topics. Um, and that's really what this book offers us. Okay, thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Wang and I'm a DQ student here on the studies. I'm both a colleague and a personal friend of Amy's, uh, but today I'm nothing more than Professor Lloyd's humble incarnation <laughs> and read out his um, beautifully written review of Amy's book. And here it starts. Um, to undertake a comparative analysis of Arthur and Michel's bold, 
to add as a third element in the comparison. The classical Chinese compilation collected under the name of Zhuangzi is vaultingly ambitious. What on earth do these texts have in common? Written in different languages, centuries apart, in very different social and political circumstances. To those who might object that there is no conceivable tertium comparationis is to get the comparison off the ground. Dr. Lee has a battery of arguments in reply. First, as to the easier part of the problem, the different languages in play, classical Chinese, French, and Dr. Lee's own English, translation is always difficult, never perfect, often in need of the support of extensive commentaries and paraphrases. But we are rarely, if ever, in a position of having to, having to conclude that we cannot understand anything of what our text interlocutors are saying. To those who invoke incommensurabilities, to make such a point, it is worth remarking that they often do not preclude comparison, indeed, sometimes presuppose it. But a second, far more important outcome of Lee's opening discussion, aiming to clear the methodological grounds, is that demand for a pre-existing tertium may be misguided. Comparison can be undertaken and prove very useful when it creates the comparanda as it goes on. Does that mean that anything can be compared to anything else? That anything goes? No, since the worthwhileness of any comparison has to be judged by its results. It does mean, however, that we should not feel debarred from comparison by differences in temporality or genre, let alone simply of language. Um, of course, all three writers achieved not, not, oh, sorry. Of course, all three writers achieved notoriety in their time for paradoxes, apparent self-contradictions, statements that undermine the very possibility of communication, a useful, if to my mind, still in one respect questionable tactic that Lee uses in this connection is to invoke certain modern developments in logic and the philosophy of mathematics. Puzzling statements in the Zhuangzi concerning the limitless can be understood as exploring questions that are continuous with those that, are, that exercised Hunter and Russell in their work on the infinite. Again, non-standard, paranormal or three-value logics nowadays investigate the possibility and the consequences of denying the law of non-contradiction. In both cases, the moves has the merit of underlining the complexity of the conceptual issues that still in many places remain open. Yet the reservation I have concerns the differing levels of explicitness in Lee's target texts and those other she invokes. Kant and Priest theorize about the problems they tackle. The Zhuangzi, Achdo and Nisho offer challenges, but no theories indeed no explicit justification of their positions. Indeed, any attempts at justification would, in their view, tend to lead back into the entanglements of logic that they are all three striving to escape. But the further danger of using modern philosophy to interpret this text is that the philosophical game, as present-day academics would define it, is not the one they are playing. Of course, academics don't all define the game in exactly the same way. But whichever way they define it, they tend to be confident that what it is to philosophize is to give reasons, arguments, justifications. Lee is concerned to show that what she labels philosophy and literature form a continuum, and I agree. But within each category, there are certainly different, more or less formal, more or less explicit ta tactics of presentation. I shall come back to that. But do the self-contradictions mean that we simply have to write off these texts and authors as not just illogical and irrational, but mad, as indeed Achdor came at one stage to be diagnosed? Not at all. Lee aims to show how they have important and serious positive things to say on rationality cosmology and ethics especially. One can make a start by drawing attention to those passages that say or imply that communication is possible, despite the contradictions. 
Words are not just wind, as Strong puts it. And Lee points out how Achdor is quite coherent when he explains the incoherence of his own poetry to Jacques Rivière. The challenge here is to do justice both to the serious messages and to the evident attempts radically to undermine the conventional views of the need for consistency. It is rather too easy to argue that the denials of the possibility of knowledge relate simply to claims to ultimate or unqualified knowledge. Taking those denials at full force, we have to see that we need to work towards a different conception of being aware. One that allows multiple perspectives, where the denials relate to the denial of the possibility of a knowledge from no perspective. On this topic, and on the related question of the views on nature and being presupposed in the three target texts, Lee imaginatively brings other readings to bear, this time from current anthropology. It is undoubtedly helpful and relevant to cross-reference the work of Viveros de Castro and de Scola, first in that they deny the universal applicability of the nature-culture dichotomy, and secondly because Viveros especially insists on the importance of what he calls perspectivism. His claim is that whereas the default assumption of Western modernity is that there is one universal nature, but the cultures differ, ethnography reveals many cases where the peoples in question hold that all sentient beings have culture, but they differ according to their different natures or bodies. So anthropology provides evidence that in many societies it is a matter of not, it is a matter not of mononaturalism with multiculturalism, but rather of monoculturalism with multinaturalism. <laughs> This nicely confirms the limited, even parochial character of our current Western assumptions about nature, thereby opening up the possibility of other readings of other works, including these three target texts. The crucial anthropological point here is that no one single definitive account has a monopoly of the truth. Not only do the accounts differ, but so too does what they are accounts of by which I mean not that there is nothing in common in what they are accounts of, but rather that they vary with the changing perspective from which they are approached. In this instance, however, I have two reservations about the way her argument develops. Firstly, in Viveros de Castro, perspectivism describes not the view of a single thinker or a set of them, so much as the cosmology of an entire people. But secondly, and maybe more fundamentally, while both de Scola and Viveros de Castro have demolished the assumption of the universality of the nature-culture dichotomy, one might say that, where Drums is concerned, this does not go far enough. Lee recognizes that neither in Drums nor in any other ancient Chinese text is there a notion that, precisely, that is precisely equivalent to nature. Many of the texts she cites speak of Tian, heaven, others of Ziran, the spontaneous, yet others of Xing, character. Yet first, these three Chinese concepts cover very different semantic fields. Secondly, instead of using these texts as to ask what Zhuang's concept of nature amounted to, it would have been preferable and actually more in tune with Li's strategic interests to have examined what Drums is talking about in a more open-ended way, even at the cost of complicating the comparison. Lee seems for once to have slipped into taking over too much of the Western conceptual framework, for she might have begun with the Chinese actors' concepts to show what a cosmological scheme without nature looks like. My final critical comment relates to the ethical stance that she detects in her target texts. She observes, in good scholastic logical fashion, that from a contradiction anything follows, and she uses that labeled trivialism to characterize that stance. Yet the quietism that follows from that principle does not, it seems to me, 
do justice to the positive recommendations that we have in Zhuangzi to make the most of spontaneity, which some would gloss rashly as nature in that sense, where the Chinese text, as Li correctly quotes it, implies that to do so is, not e is no easy matter. Being spontaneous and free, as Li herself puts it, on page 102, is sometimes the hardest thing to do. But whereas some of the execution of Li's agenda leaves her open to criticism, there can be no doubt about the overall success of her project in excavating the important message, or rather, one should say challenges her texts present, where rationality, cosmology, and ethics are concerned. Of course, the styles of presentation these texts cultivate are not those we associate with the technical analysis of philosophy and science on which we customarily rely. Rather, they test the, to the limit of our capacity to learn from the playful, the paradoxical, the aphoristic, the dreamlike, the poetic. This, is very, this very indeterminacy perfectly suits the twin messages, the multiple perspectives that the text describes and the multiple perspectives we can and should take on those perspectives. This is then an, extraordinary, an exceptionally rich and suggestive study, many aspects of which I cannot even touch on here. Dr. Lee would be the first to insist that it opens up issues for further exploration rather than attempts some last word on any of them where in many cases part of the point is that last words are a trap. We have Dr. Lee to thank for this new examination of these three texts and for having the ambition and the courage to juxtapose them, a juxtaposition that, she rightly claims, can and does create the comparanda as it goes along. And that's it. Um, well, that was um, from Jeffrey Lloyd, a um, very thoughtful and as you can tell, um, gives a picture of the denseness and richness and uh, difficulty of Amy's book. Um, and the questions that Matthew um, actually defined for us were very, very helpful. I'm going to, um, first of all, I want to say that I congratulate you very strongly on what is a bold, I think you've heard that, a bold, difficult and original um, undertaking. And I think one of its great values is that not only one does discover a lot about the three texts, but actually one does also, um, one's mind is led to further questions, and I expect that that will be what Amy will work on next, I mean, or perhaps already is, I mean, that, that in a sense this is, this is the, the first, um, the first, I was going to think of the, of the Emperor of China with making the first furrow in the, in the earth at the beginning of the year, to kind of signal, signal the fact that the harvest will come. In a sense, this is, this is that. It's a very, very powerful uh, first stroke in the ground of um, a very inquiring and interesting mind. Um, I want to take three headings, rationality, cosmology, and ethics, and give you a bit of the context, um, as I see it, for the questions that Amy has raised in such an original way. First of all, Geoffrey Lloyd himself has, of course, worked a little bit in these fields as a sort of investigator of the sacred. And he is also at Cambridge. And that is one of the places where the first context, I think, of your inquiry really, and that's Needham. I don't know if he actually sort of turns up in you. I, can't, I don't, didn't notice. He's Science and Civilization in China. Um, a book that was a talismanic book for my generation, um, an enormous number of volumes, in which no distinction is made in exactly the same way that Amy doesn't make distinctions between the modes of inquiry that are, could be considered rational or irrational. So there is a, a huge section in, in, his, in his book on science um, into Taoist, the Taoist methods. And I think that also widens into another section of the, another aspect of the 60s, which in a way is not articulated in Amy's book, but is important, and that is the, the long inquiry that went on into Chinese philosophy um, from poets like Allen Ginsberg. I mean, it's a very strange thing that the 60s and 50s and 60s were dominated by people turning their faces to see if they, what they could find to escape from the straitjacket of something that 
they felt constricting but didn't, couldn't even quite put their fingers on what it was. And, and Arthur and Michaud are um, the forebears, if you like, of that 60s inquiry. Just at purely anecdotal level, the, one of the very first books I was ever asked to review in the days when the TLS was still anonymous was a forgotten, rightly forgotten book by Julia Kristeva called This Chinoise. And I couldn't have been more symptomatic. One should go back and look at it. Symptomatic of the, of the actual ground in which these, these questions um, took root. Looking, to, looking, to, looking for another way of thinking. So, um, the idea of rationality. I put this slide up because Leonardo is the only person identified so far, um, to my knowledge, who, before a certain date, actually wrapped reason and imagination <coughs> round the cortex, round the cortex, and did not divide them. So for Aristotle, they were in two boxes in the mind. Leonardo came along and said, no, when we think and we look through our eyes, you can see the passage there, we think we look with our eyes, we take in the information through our eyes, we stream it through the brain, and then we, un we, we unpack it and understand it with, with our head. And our head is reason and fantasy, bound together. Very, very exceptional vision of things. One of the ways that this developed later, much later, again, within surrealism, um, is the question of how the brain reads data. And again, you see an aspect of Chinese aesthetics which appealed very greatly to, um, uh, to uh, surrealists later, um, but, um, but, they, but also to psychologists now, and is one of the lines of inquiry that Amy opens up definitely leads into consciousness studies today. This idea that what, what Arthur and Michaud were on about, which they were in dialogue in her, in her analysis with the Trunksy, um, was um, this idea that you can actually form concepts um, in an entirely imaginative way because the data is not actually there. So they were interested in how these rocks um, scholars, the greatest of the Taoist scholars, would collect rocks and they would meditate on the rocks and they gave them titles and they saw things in them and they are of exceptional beauty, though beauty is a term that one could challenge because they're also strange. But the, the point is that they're not formless to the mind, to the reading mind. Um, so they call them peaks and grottos and so forth. And they have an aesthetic an aesthetic power that is to do with, the, with what Amy is inquiring into, which is what are the limits of rationality? How, do, how, how do we, what is our reason doing when we read this as peaks and grottos? And of course now, one, the later aesthetic um, knowledge comes in, and so for us, I mean, if I asked you what artist is this, you would all say, I think, Giacometti. So it's a, it's, a, it's a way that our brains constantly process things that are actually not, as it were, there. Well, the great collector of these, the great collector and the great writer about um, stones and their meanings and consciousness was Roger Caillois. Um, and he in instances some of the thinking that went into the trunk set in his book, Pierre. So it's another example of how, um, how rationality was an absolutely insufficient category. And that's in her, she's greatly enriched that understanding. So now on to cosmology. I don't, don't want to take too much time. Cosmo, um, cosmology, um, let me just show you. This, this, is a, this is a very famous um, stone, very famous kind of rock that you find in the basin of the Arna. And it reads, it's much loved by the ancient Romans and by the Renaissance Romans for its way of looking like ruined cities and, and landscapes. And that's Kaiwa particularly liked devils and um, phantoms that appeared in stones. Again, reason, our reasoning brain, <coughs> finding, looking all the time to make sense of things that are chaotic. Um, so yeah, on cosmology, I know that um, Matthew quite rightly pointed to Amy's desire not to fall into traps, but this, this, cosmo this cosmological question actually relates also to the ethics that um, she raises later. And this is the great, you will know about this, this is the great rights controversy. And just very, very quickly, I'm sure most of you in the room know the rights controversy in the 17th century, for which the Jesuits were suppressed. Now, the Jesuits were suppressed because they argued, I'm sorry, I'm, sorry I'm repeating it for people who know it all too well, they, is, they argued that Confucius's rights 
um, of worship of the ancestors, as enjoined on all families, were not religious. This was family piety. And therefore, it could be included by con into a converted family. So here you see the idea of the supernatural being shifted. It's and the church refused that. The church said, no, if you, if you invoke the past in form of ghosts, you are keeping the supernatural within, with it. you're putting it in one place. So again, the, one needs to, um, I can see that there was this cross-fertilization, and that's a key turning point. By 1492, when the Jews and the, and the uh, Muslims were, and Arabs were expelled from Spain by the Catholic Church and the, the Catholic kings, key turning point in the intolerance, the irrational intolerance of European culture. This was another one, the rights controversy. Had the rights controversy been permitted, we would have had a, a shifted supernatural, um, which would, uh, um, in your category of nature, you quite rightly, and the fact that it doesn't, Jeffrey points out that it doesn't have, there isn't a concept that exactly matches this, this ethical, the ethics um, of the rights controversy matches that. And then Arthur, and um, I think this is where we really do see how the ethics question um, is raised by, um, um, by Amy's book very, very well. Um, Arthur took part and very much admired um, Théodore Dreyer, who made probably one of the most passionately religious films ever made. I'm going to show you, that's Arthur looking unbelievably beautiful, um, um, as the priest, as the priest in the, in the Passion of Joan of Arc. And you'd think that he might not have liked playing the priest. At first, he plays the, her questioner, her interrogator, who believes that she's a heretic and that she's a witch. And he comes on very hard at one, interrogating her in prison. And then he realizes her integrity. And by the end, he offers her the crucifix and realizes that she, has, she, that he, she is entirely sincere. So he, he makes a, um, a confession of faith in her. The interesting thing is that Arthur played this with such fervor and endorsed it very much when he spoke about how he played in the film. So I think here you get again a shift of ground of the ethics, that the idea of the personal conscience rather than the supernatural mattering. I'll just show you, just so you see him offering her the cross. It is silent, by the way. It's a silent film, and Dreyer himself said that he wanted it to be played in silence. So it's always given a, it's always given a, um, a, a soundtrack these days. Several, several scores have been written for it. Um, so he says that, um, and he said about it, um, that he was no longer dealing with the aesthetic, with a specific bias. But with, this is Arthur talking about playing in the film. But with a body of work, with a man committed to elucidating one of the most harrowing problems that exists. Dreyer was committed to portraying, in Jeanne d'Arc, a victim of one of the saddest distortions there are, the distortion of a divine principle passing between the brains of men named the government or the church or whatever other name you wish. I think there you see this um, question of where should the authority for ethics be placed? And you see it shifting. So, Amy, well done. <laughs> um, so, thank you very much for your responses, and they were all very insightful reflections. So, I guess I'll go um, back in order. So, first, Ray Marina, thank you very much. I think, um, <coughs> Christy, when you, know, when you mentioned the context about thinking <coughs> of Chinese philosophy or thought, and also in the 60s, or I would say um, post-war period, when a lot of continental thinkers, uh, especially the French school, um, were seeking an alternative mode of thought. And Oriental, so-called, they call it sagesse or wisdom, seemed particularly attractive to them uh, at that point, um, whether it was 
ancient China or it was Maoism, contemporary China at that point. And I do think um, in, in my book that that's part of the context why I was thinking of relating after Nisho to um, ancient Chinese philosophy. But also because, um, of course, I realize there have been a lot of misappropriations or say creative recycling of Chinese thought and culture um, by the French. Um, and they have been criticized a lot for that. Um, and I think um, what I wanted to argue for Akhto and Michaud's case was that they are not simplistic Orientalists. And they are not, as I, as I mentioned in my book and the quote which Matthew read, they are not seeking spiritual therapy in, in the East and seeing, oh, this is something that's going to solve all our Western problems and we are going to idealize that. Actually, they are much more sophisticated in thinking about it. Um, and then your point about um, Arthur's um, interest in uh, the divine principle and uh, supernatural and personal conscience. I think that's exactly what I was trying to pinpoint in, in, the, in that the idea was, for instance, the, the principle of cruelty, which Arthur talked a lot and which I related to nature in my book, um, was that Arthur was very anti-institutional and he was the kind of person who would say, let's burn the library of Alexandria um, I don't care about the French canon, um, but that's because all these institutions are not real culture. They are just petrifications of culture we are clinging on to. And they also say this kind of divine or the sacred um, uh, supernatural consciousness of ethics that he is trying to capture in his life, which he finds completely... Um, petrified or, or institutionalized when it enters cultural institutions, when it enters different forms and relations of power, which I think Arthur and also Zhuangzi was um, uh, very much trying to subvert. Um, so I thank you very much for, for your comments. Now, um, just to go back to a few points of, of Jeffrey's comments, um, which as you see that he did criticize me a lot. <laughs> and, and, and very insightfully. Uh, first, about the, since I was just talking about subversion of power, about the uh, quietism that he said was a bit uh, unsatisfactory in that I was trying to make an argument for quietism in, in the ethics of Arthur Michel and Jones because, um, in fact, I was not saying that, oh, be pacifists or that they are saying anything like, um, uh, fatalist resignation. I'm saying more that quietism has not been appreciated or thought very deeply about, especially in Western culture, because quietism or pacifism is usually related to a kind of passiveness, which is not true, or inaction. Whereas um, I think uh, thinkers like Jones or Michel are trying to say that there can be an ethics that concentrates on self-cultivation rather than constantly trying to transform others. And um, I think two reasons, major reasons for their um, advocating quietism in, in their own very complex ways was firstly, because they think they see many people who try to transform others but actually make things worse, um, or in the sense that uh, many people who try to change others, many moralists are, flawed, are fundamentally flawed themselves. And they think you have to cultivate yourself before doing anything else. This is the first thing. Second thing is, so um, as the French uh, Swiss philosopher Bivita said, in about the bon pouvoir. So, so there's no such thing as good <coughs> power. And um, it's not that um, you could use power in a good way or enter into a power network and try to renegotiate power relations so that you can improve things. For thinkers like Michel and Trump, I think what they're saying is that once you enter into that network, you will always be exploited. And the only way to be radically uh, subversive towards power is just not to enter it, just to refuse it completely. That's why I think their ethics, my argument was that their ethics focuses more on being on cosmological ethics rather than a social ethics, because um, the, the social, human, power relationships are exactly things they want to escape. Um, and um, yes, and, and I think Jeffrey's idea about talking about the Chinese cosmology without nature is actually a very brilliant idea. Um, and I, I think I did have um, a kind of Western conceptual framework in a sense where I was looking at the very heterogeneous uh, ideas about the cosmos in Chinese texts, like the Zhuangzi. I was still feeling the need 
for an articulation of the notion of nature, although I realized they didn't really exist in those texts. Whereas Jeffrey has point out, pointed out a way of saying that you don't really need to have the notion at all. So I think that would be an interesting path to pursue. Um, and then finally, uh, Matthew's comments, which were all very pertinent, and thank you very much. Um, I, I especially like what you said about my uh, methodology in that, um, yes, I know the, uh, what, what I was basically saying is that I'm putting forth a fiction of these texts, and it's a necessary fiction. Um, and in fact, um, literary criticism by itself is um, a kind of fiction of literature as well. Um, but I think it's worth doing because um, I can say something insightful about it. Um, I also mentioned the fact that literature can self-theorize itself, uh, in that when we are, as critics or theorists, looking at literature, um, there has been too much of tendency to try to impose a kind of theoretical framework on certain texts and then kind of put them on a procrastinist bed and then cut them according to our uh, preferences. Whereas, in fact, a lot of theoretical thoughts can already emerge almost organically from the texts themselves. And I think I was trying to really put an emphasis on that. Um, and then the part about influence, because actually I put up a, a argument against influence in my book, um, is that I think that there are different ways of being historical and anachronistic about literature. And when you say anachronism, it seems to be a negative term, but I think sometimes you can use it for positive effects. Not everything is, um, say, determined by um, history. And also when you talk about historical context, it's not something out there. It's not a given reality or an objective fact which you can just retrieve. You have to construct historical context. And you know, depending on how you construct it, in fact, there is already a lot of interpretation, fictional literary writing in that. Um, so I thought, since my texts are so widely disparate, actually it would be good for me to exploit this fictional or constructive, contextually constructive point um, to, to make my arguments. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.